When you record a macro, Excel converts your commands into VBA code or Visual Basic Application code that it can use and stores it. So for example, when you execute a macro, and I did it on Utah here, it converted it to purple, about yay big, bold, italics, underline. If I don't like it, and I want some other colors, or I want to tweak it, you can either re-record it, or you can try to edit the macro. And when I say try, I mean that it's beyond the scope when it comes to editing the VBA code. I can get your feet wet and take a look at it. But if you want to go into more depth, then I suggest you look at another training video on editing VBA code. So to introduce you to the editing of our macro, come up here, click on the View tab, go to the Macros group, click on the Macro button, and there's the macro. You can either click on Step Into or Edit. It opens up the same window. And there's the macro. And if you have more macros down below, you can select it. It's by module. Select it over here, and it'll display it over to the right-hand side. In any case, what you see up here in green is just notes. So anything to the right of an apostrophe is stating what the macro is about. My spiffy state format, the shortcut control A, and then down below some basic things that I could walk you through when it comes to editing it would be like the name of the font instead of Arial. How about Comic Sans? And then size 50. You see, not too difficult, right? But be careful that you don't sneeze because if you add an extra dot or you delete a character, it can screw up the whole thing. So I'm just showing you the basics that it can be edited. Anything more than that, as far as adding something that's not already here, you want to take a VBA coding class. In any case, when you're done, come up here, click on File, go down to Close and Return, and let's go ahead and execute the macro. Remember the shortcut key is Control A, so with Utah selected, Control A, it's bigger. Let me click on Home, and it's in Comic Sans. Hey, nice. And some other things you may guess right or tweak, but be careful. You don't want to corrupt code and destroy your computer. In any case, probably the best option until you learn more about VBA or how to code is to go ahead and just re-record it and delete the one here. Or re-record and overwrite the macro with the new recordings and the steps for that macro. When you record a macro, by default, it's using absolute referencing. In other words, when you're moving from cell to cell to cell during the recording, the very last cell that you select is the cell that the macro will always go to, no matter whatever cell you select when you run the macro later. So for example, when I come up here and I record this in bold, and I come down here and make the total in red, let's go ahead and do that. Let's start up here, come down here, click on record, and we'll say this is absolute. And let's do control shift M and click OK. So we got the cell selected. Let's select bold and come down here and that's the very last cell in the recording and come up here and make it red that when I come down here and click stop and I come over here and I'm like oh let me go ahead and run the macro so it makes quarter two in bold and then 2000 in red so control shift M it goes back to cell B9. Why? Because that's absolute referencing. Again the very last cell that you select during the recording no matter whatever cell you go to, to run the macro, it'll always go back to. And so if I come over here to quarter three, it'll make it bold, but go back to cell B9 and so on. And that's the default, again, absolute referencing when you record your macro. Now, if you want to keep it relative, you actually have to turn it on. The relative referencing is the relative distance between the cell you started in and the cell you ended up in during the recording. It's the same distance the macro will take you to when you later run the macro, no matter what cell you start in. So it's keeping it relative. So if I go ahead and do this again and make it relative, and I go, that's bold, that's in red, then no matter where I start within the worksheet, like right here, it'll make that in bold. And then, wait a second, how many cells? One, two, three, four, five. On the sixth cell from, well, right here, one, two, three, four, five, six. On the sixth cell, it'll make it red relative to the recording. So again, it doesn't matter wherever I start it when it comes to relative referencing. It'll keep that same distance between cells when I run the macro. And before I go ahead and click record, we need to come up here and click on the developer tab, which by the way, if you don't have it on the ribbon, go ahead and right click anywhere on the ribbon and go down to customize the ribbon. And then come down and check developer, click OK. Then on the developer tab over in the code group, 
select use relative references then you can go ahead and record your macro either up here or down here doesn't matter so I'm in cell D3 for quarter three go ahead and click on record and this will be relatives and then we can go ahead and use the shortcut key let's do shift Q and click OK and then let's come up here on the home tab and make that bold then come down here and let's choose a different color so we can really distinguish between the two How about purple well we'll make that bold as well so let's go ahead with that stop the recording and then come over here and let's go ahead and run the recording control shift Q sweet it didn't go back to the last cell that I selected during the recording but kept it relative the same distance between the cells no matter what cell that I select to run the macro even if it's way over here control shift Q and you can see in that cell up here on the home tab in the font group purple bold and then up here it's supposed to be bold there we go bold now I don't use relative references a lot so I want to make sure that I turn it off developer tab to the code and deselect use relative references And then finally, with conditional formatting, I'm going to show you how you can use a formula to determine which cells to format. And the cells that you want to format doesn't have to be the same range that contains the numbers. It can actually be a range that has a bunch of text. For example, if I want to be able to format any months that has cells greater than 1,000, so February will, not March, that's at 1,000, but not greater than 1,000, June, July, and December, then we can go ahead and select the range come up here on the home tab to the styles group click on conditional formatting and go down to new rule and then select use formula to determine which cells to format then come down below and type in your formula now the formula is going to be well first starting with cell B3 does B3 or the number therein greater than a thousand so equals B3 greater than 1000 if so then what format do we want to apply to it Let's go ahead and click on the format button and choose a format. I'm going to go to the fill tab and choose green. Oh, that's a fun color. Let's go ahead and click OK. Click OK and there you go. Now notice that we started with B3. Well, that's the only thing we typed in. And so it's dynamic, the formula. Just as we learned in an earlier training video with copying and pasting, unless you tell it to stay put by using absolute references, it's going to update. So with the range selected over here, we're going down row by row. So it takes a look at the first cell over in the next range here that we chose. It could be a range over here, but it happened to be adjacent to the data that I want to apply the formatting to. And it takes a look at it, it says cell B3. Are you greater than a thousand? If not, let's go down to the next row, which is four. Greater than a thousand? Yes. So it formatted it. Then it went down greater than a thousand and so on. Having said that, if there ever comes a time where you don't want it to be dynamic, you just want to focus on one cell when it comes to applying your condition, then come back up here, click on conditional formatting. Let's go down to manage rules. And it's not for our current selection. Let's do it for the entire worksheet here. And it's this one right here. Double click on it to edit it. And we can say, stay in row three. Do not come down and update as it shifts down with the selection that I have over here for the conditional formatting. So if I apply a dollar sign in front of the number three and click OK and click OK, nothing is going to be formatted. Why? Because it's telling it to stay in row three. And so as I'm moving down, like to February, it says, is 975 greater than 1,000 for February? Of course not. Remember, it's staying here. It's not coming down here because we put an absolute reference or a dollar sign to always stay in row three. Now that makes sense because we're going down row by row from one month to the next. If we were going over column by column, then you want to put a dollar sign to keep it static next to the B. So let's go ahead and select the range and undo that. Conditional formatting to manage rules. Double click. Get rid of the absolute reference so you don't have to absolutely stay in row three. We want you to update. Click OK and then go down from one row to the next as we have selected over here and compare and contrast between is that greater than a thousand yes then go ahead and apply green to the month of february and these other last three months and then finally as we talked about in an earlier training video when it comes to sorting cells that contain colors well we didn't have any back then but hey we do now and so when you look at this range right here let me come up here and click on conditional formatting and click on manage rules here's the conditions 
any cell that's less than 980, go ahead and put it in the red. Anything greater than 980 is in the blue. So that's fine. Let's go ahead and close out. And then to sort it, let's go ahead and select any cell within our database. And then come up here, click on the Data tab, go to the Sort and Filter group, and let's click on the Sort, which is the Custom Sort. And we'll say Sort by Column B, which is this column right here, of course. And then do we want to base it upon values or cell color? And then when we do it by cell color, it finds all the colors within that column there. And we just have two, and we can say, let's have red on top. Click OK, and there you go. Of course, it messes up the months because in February, we had cells that were greater than these lesser months here. So that got flipped down below, sorted into the blues. And then, of course, if you want to go ahead and undo that and sort it back to the sort by months, then come back up here, click on sort, click on the drop down arrow, do it for total sales. And then go ahead and click on the drop down arrow, do it based upon values. And then click on A to Z to custom list. And then choose January, February, March, and so on. Click OK, click OK, and we're back to where we started here. And then finally, you can actually filter by color. Just select any cell within the data range here of the database. And then come up here on the data tab to the sort and filter group. Click on filter. Gets the two little drop down arrows. Click on the one for the column B. And we can filter by color and say we just want to see pink. Cool. And then when we're done, we can go ahead and clear it all. And then deselect filter to go back to the way it was. If you haven't noticed by now that when you select a range of cells, it contains numbers. In the lower right hand corner, you get the quick analysis tool that when you click on it, it gives you some options when it comes to quickly analyzing the range that you selected, like conditional formatting, charts, totals, tables, or converting into spark lines. Let's go ahead and go back to conditional formatting and hover over data bars. You can see a preview of it that when you hover off of it, it disappears. Let's choose color, click on it, click off, and you can quickly analyze it by looking at the darkest green as the largest number, and then the darkest red is the lowest or smallest number. Go ahead and reselect it. Bottom right hand corner, click on quick analysis, and we can go ahead and clear it. Now, if you're not too picky, you get some of the more popular tools there. But if you are, then just come up here because everything you saw in the quick analysis is all up on the ribbon, but more detail or more options to choose from, like on the home tab to the styles group, conditional formatting for the data bars. Ooh, -wee, look at all them choices. Go ahead and hover over one of those. Like I said, if you want to do a quick analysis, that's what it's called. Go ahead and use that. Otherwise, if you're kind of picky like me, you want something a little bit shiny and green. The data validation feature is data that has to be met within a certain condition or criteria that you set. So, for example, for these three employees, Simpson, Humphreys, and Heffernan, when they want to expense their entertainment, it has to be $100 or less. Now, right now, there's nothing to prevent them from entering in over $100, except when I use the data validation rule, I can control that. So select the range that you want to control, the data input, and then come up here and click on the Data tab. Go to the Data Tools group, and there you go. Click on the drop-down arrow, and we want to go to Data Validation. Click on that, and by default, every cell allows any value. We're going to change that for this range that we have selected. Click on the drop-down arrow, and go down to Decimal, and the data has to be less than or equal to $100. And then click OK. So when somebody tries to type in something over $100, like Mr. Simpson, 101, hit Enter, they get the raspberries. This value does not match the data validation restrictions defined for this cell. Well, what the fudge is that? What's the restriction? Is it 2 bucks, 5 bucks, 10 bucks? Well, you can help them out a little bit. So they'll have to click Cancel, in which case it clears it out. So there's the control. And they won't be able to enter in anything over $100. So what we can do is reselect our range again. So we can add like an input message or a warning or both by coming back up here on the data tab to the data tools group, clicking on the drop down arrow to data validation. And there's the input message and error alert. Now the input message only shows up when the cell is selected. So we can go ahead and say something like for the title. Enter an expense, but must be $100 or less. And if we want something more, because they don't get the input message and they want to type in over $100, then
then we can do the error alert. By default, it's going to stop them. And that's what we saw when they tried to enter in over $100. And you don't have to do the input message. You can actually just have the error alert. But instead of giving you something that we don't understand, we can actually type in why it stopped them. Like the title is going to be reimbursement. We won't reimburse anything over $100. Now you do get two other options. If you don't want to prevent them from entering in over $100, you can also do a warning or informational. So for the warning, it's just like that. It means when you select it, you get this yield sign that says warning. We won't pay anything over $100 or maybe we will. And we want them to say, okay, this is for your information. We may not, in which case I could type in we may not. Both of them allow them to enter in anything over 100 except for the stop. That blocks them, but it gives them a message as to why they can't enter in anything over $100, as you just saw, except without the explanation. So let's leave it with the explanation for stop and click OK. And so when he types in, well, when you select the cell, you can see the input message, enter in expense, but must be $100 or less. Great. Click off. It disappears. Select the cell again. So now you know. But if you try to bypass it and type in 101, there you go, reimbursement. We won't reimburse anything over $100. Do you want to try again? Well, when you click on retry, it highlights the cell, the contents they're in, in which case you can try to get by it again, but you still get the same error. In which case, we'll click cancel. And let's go ahead and select the range. Come back up here, data validation, and change it from stop to warning to show you what it looks like when it allows you to actually enter in something, but with the warning, that is. Click okie dokie, type in 101, hit enter. Uh, we won't reimburse. Do you want to continue? There you go. So if you say yes, it accepts it. But hey, we gave them a warning in both places. One, when they selected the cell for the input message, the pop-up. And two, when they try to type in something over $100 with that warning. And let's say they did 90. And then 95. Now, if there's a policy change after data has been entered into a cell, and you want to update the validation rules for that range, what's going to happen, like let's say for example for this range, we want to update it so it's got to be $90 or less. And we just did it that night after everybody inputted their numbers. Well, let's see what happens and how Excel handles that by coming back up here, Data Tools Group, click on Data Validation, the drop-down arrow to Data Validation. And of course, we'll have to update all this to say instead of 100, now it's 90, input message will also be 90 and then the settings now we have to say it's got to be 90 or less click OK and you can see it updates the input message to $90 but it doesn't do anything to those cells that is over $90 but if you want to be able to do a quick check because you can imagine if you had a huge database and you're like okay which ones are over 100 I mean you could probably spot them but isn't it easier to have them circled in red because hey that's graphical for me I want to see that so to do that you want to circle all those cells that are in violation of the data validation rule, then come up here to the data tools group again, click on the drop down arrow and say you want to circle invalid data. There you go. So now they're out of line, but if they come back in and they change it to $90 or less, then the red circle disappears. And then if you don't want to even deal with it and say, look, I don't want to see the red circles. You don't have to enter in a new number if you want to keep the number because that's what he really expends. And so we'll go, okay, this one time, then come back up here, click on the drop down arrow and do clear validation circles and it's gone. Now a few other things I want to show you is like you can control the amount of text that can be entered into a cell like the destination because when it comes to sales and they're going throughout the country it's just within the United States and we can use the post office abbreviation for the states just two letters like for Utah, UT, Arizona, AZ. And then let's come back up here with the cell selected for the destination and do data validation again change it from any value to text length and the text length has to be less than or equal to two characters and then like I said you can have an input message an error alert or both how about if we just skip the input message and do an error alert and stop them from entering in anything more than two characters so it doesn't accept anything more than that otherwise if we want to we could say well give it a warning or information so let's do stop and say something like for the states, please enter in only two letters. Click OK. So when somebody comes up here and says, hey, I've been to Utah, U-T-A-H, hit enter. Oh, only two letters. Oh, rats. Retry. U-T, 
enter, it accepts it. And then finally, if you want to be able to have a list to choose from to really control what they input into a cell, then come back up here, and we're talking about departments here. So we've got the sales, training, consulting, things like that. Come back up here, click on the data validation drop down arrow to data validation. Let's go to the settings tab. It's not any value. We want it from a list. Now the list can come from one of two ways. Either click in the source field and then start typing in your list, like sales, and then use the comma as your delimiter or separator from the other data, like sales, training, comma, consulting. And then when you're done, just go ahead and click okie dokie. And then you get the drop down arrow. When you click off, you don't see it. But when you click on the cell, you're like, oh, what's that? That's cute. Click on the drop down arrow. Oh, they're controlling my input. Well, from not from one of these three departments, I guess I can't expense anything. But you can go ahead and select it, and there you go. Now, you can do it that way, or with it selected, come back up here, click on the drop-down arrow, and go to Data Validation. And you can actually select the source if you already have it typed within your spreadsheet, or within your workbook, for that matter, on another worksheet. And there's my range there. So we can go ahead and clear that out. Click on the Collapsible Dialog Box button, or with the cursor flashing in it, just go ahead and click and drag, and it collapses and expands it open, which by the way, this range, the named range, is department DEPT, which is really nice because you can imagine if you had a huge range that went for 100 cells, clicking and dragging can get ridiculous because if you overshoot it, then you got to come back. So it's nice if you can just go ahead and type in equals DEPT because that will work as well. And then click okie dokie, and then come up here, click on the drop down arrow, and hey, it's pulling everything from this range. So if you want to update the range and include anything that you've added or have taken away from it, then you'll go ahead and select the cell and make sure that you select any extra cells or additional cells for that data validation that you want to include in that drop-down list here. If there ever comes a time that you want others to view your worksheet, but without allowing them to make any changes to a cell or range of cells, you can protect it by either coming up here and clicking on the Review tab, going to the Changes group and clicking on Protect Sheet, or you can come down here and right-click on the Worksheet tab itself and go ahead and protect that sheet by clicking on it there. It brings up the same window. And notice that by default, the box is checked to protect worksheet and contents of locked cells. You can't protect them unless they're locked first, and by default, all the cells in your worksheet are locked. Well, how does that work? Let's go ahead and close out. Because if it's locked, you're thinking, oh, I can't make any changes to it. And that's not true, as you just saw there. Let me go ahead and undo that and right-click on the cell. And I'll prove to you that it's locked by coming down here and going down to Format Cells and clicking on the Protection tab. And you can see that it's locked. And this explains it all down below. Locking cells or hiding formulas has no effect until you protect the worksheet. And so by locking it, you can still make changes to it. But once you protect it, it actually turns the lock mode on for those cells or range of cells. And it also works for hiding cells that contain functions or formulas that you don't want anybody to see. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So knowing that our cells are all locked by default, let's go ahead and click Cancel. And when I protect the worksheet by, well, right-clicking down below or coming up here on the Review tab to the Changes group and clicking on Protect Sheet, you can do it with or without the password. If you do it without the password, just go ahead and click OK. And when they try to make changes to it, like typing in 90 and hit, well, there you go. The cell or chart you're trying to change is on a protected sheet. I can make changes to the other sheets, but not this one. To make a change, unprotect the sheet. You might be requested to enter in a password, so click OK. So that's one layer of security, meaning that they can't make any changes by mistake by accidentally hitting some numbers and then hitting Enter and then going, oops, what did I do? And so if they really need to have access to it, they can go ahead and come up here and click on Protect Sheet, and then they can go ahead and type in whatever numbers they want and make the changes. And then, of course, you can password protect it. So if you want to come down here and right-click, and go to Protect Sheet, and type in Boo, hit Enter. It'll ask you then to re-enter in the same password, and then hit Enter. Now it's protected. So if somebody tries to make any changes, it says you can't. Let's go ahead and close out to unprotect it. To make changes, click on Protect. you got to type in the password, boo, hit Enter. Now you can go ahead and make changes to the worksheet or any cells on the worksheet. Now let's go ahead and create a scenario where when it comes to entering in their quarter one totals, I'd like the employees to do it. Let's say I don't have any here or this is from last year. 
and we're using the same spreadsheet for this year. So they have to go ahead and overwrite the totals here. In any case, I just want them to make changes here. I don't want them to make changes anywhere else. So to prevent them from making changes, I'll go ahead and unlock these cells, then protect the worksheet because all the other cells will be locked and they won't be able to make any changes to those cells. So to unlock this range of cells, with it selected, go ahead and right click on the selection, go down to Format Cells, uncheck Locked, click OK. Now that range is unlocked. And then when you click in the next column for commission, you can see up here in the formula bar, they can see the formula, how I calculate their commission and also their bonus. What if I don't want them to see how I go about calculating it? In other words, the functions or formulas within those range of cells, I can go ahead and select it and then right click, go down to format cells, and then go ahead and check hidden. So they won't be able to see the functions or formulas within those cells once I protect the worksheet. Just the results of those functions or formulas. Click okie dokie. And then let's go ahead and protect it. And let's just come up here to the changes group. Click on protect. We won't enter in a password. But before I go ahead and do that, down below, you can allow users of this worksheet, once it's protected, to select lock cells and select unlock cells. They can even format cells once it's protected by checking the box here but I don't want them to format any cells. I just want them to view and make changes to the range of cells that are unlocked and go ahead and click OK. And so you can see when I select any cell after I protected it up in the formula bar, hey, you can't see the if function. You can't see the vertical lookup function. Cool. And then when they want to make any changes, they can do it here because I unlocked it before I protected it. And if they try to make changes to any other cell, even a blank cell here and type in something, Again, uh, 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 I didn't unlock that. So you can't make a change to it unless you got the password or if it requires a password. Otherwise, just go ahead and click on protect and now you can make changes to it. And you can see when I select the cell, I can now see the if function and the vertical lookup. And of course, well, we can already make changes to the range here. We can just make it to any other cell as well. Password protecting a cell or a range of cells means that they're only editable with the password after the worksheet has been protected. So if I assign a password to each one of these cells here and give it to each corresponding employee, then only that employee with that password has access to that cell to update the quarter one total. Or I can go ahead and assign one password to the entire range and give that password to the admin assistant, and so the employees can still view it without allowing them to make any changes to it. And then if there's any discrepancies, they'll have to go through the admin assistant to be able to update it because maybe there are some other qualifiers and to what makes up their quarter one total. So in the first scenario, let's go ahead and assign one password to Marge here to be able to, when the sheet is protected, update her quarter one total. To do that with it selected, come up here, click on the review tab, go to the changes group, and there it is, allow users to edit ranges. Now it says ranges, but you can select a single cell, go ahead and click on it and then click on new. It's referring to a range, but again, we just want a single cell and we'll just type in the title for Marge. And what's it referring to? Well, you can go ahead and delete it and click and drag to select an entire range, but we're not gonna do that. So we'll delete that and just go ahead and select that cell, B6. And then the cell password is gonna be lowercase Marge. I know it's generic, but you can come up with something better than that. And then go ahead and click okay. Then confirm it by typing in Marge again, hit enter, and there we go. There's the first one. Let's do the second one by clicking on New. And it's going to be, let's just do WC for Wilberforce Claiborne. And it refers to, well, not cell B6. It's the next cell down below, which is going to be B7. Then the password is WC. Then hit enter, WC to confirm it, hit enter. Well, you get the idea. You can just keep going on and on and on. But when you're done, you can go ahead and click on Protect Sheet. Let me go ahead and click OK and then pretend later on we want to protect the worksheet. You don't have to come back up here to click on it to protect the sheet, as you recall. Let me click Cancel. You can come up here on the Review tab to the Changes group and click Protect Sheet or just right click on the tab and go up to Protect Sheet. Let me click and drag this up. You can do it with or without a password. It'll still be protected, but the level of security is do they need a password? Let's just go ahead and click OK and say that they don't. But with or without a password, is still going to force them to go ahead when they want to you know, double click on a cell. If the cell is locked and it doesn't require a password, it says you can't make any changes unless you unprotect the worksheet. Okay, 
So when Marge comes in and double clicks on this cell to make a change to it, it says, do you have a password? Of course, Marge. Hit enter. Now she can go ahead and make a change to it. Hit enter. And it's for this entire session. That is the password. Once you enter it, you don't have to enter in again. So she can come up here and go, no, no, no. It was back to 80. And then when she saves and closes out of it, reopens it, it's a new session. So she'll have to type in her password again. And then finally, if you need to make any changes to those password protected cells, you want to update them or just remove them, then let's go ahead and unprotect the sheet by coming up here and clicking on the review tab to the changes group unprotect and then going over to allow users to edit ranges. And there's those, well, not ranges, but a single cell. You can select it, modify it, make your changes, click cancel or with it selected, go ahead and delete them and then click OK. And then of course, if we protect the sheet now and say OK, double click, we remove the password protection from the cell so Marge can't have access to her own quarter one total cell B6. If you're going to be passing your workbook off to somebody else or publishing it to the web, if you've got any personal or hidden information that you want removed before handing it over, you may want to consider using the document inspector. It'll find all that stuff, or I'll show you the things that it looks for you can go ahead and remove all of it in a single click. If there's any one thing that you want to keep, don't use the document inspector because it removes everything. It's like a nuke. So for example, things like comments, like when I hover over that cell, Marge wants to raise this one, Lizzie wants to relocate to Hawaii. I can go ahead and remove all of those after I use the document inspector to find those comments and remove them in a single click. Also, it'll find hidden columns or rows like the column F is hidden. So it goes from E to G. So when I click and drag from E to G and then right click, as we learned in an earlier training video, to unhide it, because you have to select the columns or rows before and after what's hidden. Then you can go ahead and unhide it. And then it pushes it over to make room for the hidden column, which is F. But what it does is that when you inspect it for hidden columns and you have them removed, it actually removes the column. So this doesn't get pushed over. It stays here. And then it realphabetizes it or renumbers it. So after it removes column F, then what used to be column G, when it was hidden, is now F, and then it goes H, I, J, K, and so on. Well, I'll show you that in just a minute. Let's go ahead and undo that so we can have it hidden again. And then when I right-click on any worksheet tab and I go to unhide, notice that I have a bonus sheet that's being hidden. It deletes it, so it will remove those. Let's go ahead and click cancel. In any case, to go ahead and take a look at the document inspector and see what it finds and what we want removed, Come up here, click on the File tab, go Backstage, Info selected by default, and then down below where it says Inspect Workbook, it says before publishing this file or giving it to somebody else, be aware that it contains comments, document properties, as you can see over here. Click on Show All Properties. It's got my hyperlink base, my company name. Anything here that I don't want, I can go ahead and remove in a single click. And then you got hidden columns. I showed you that. Hidden worksheets, invisible objects, and content that people with disabilities find difficult to read. So let's go ahead and check for these issues by coming over here, clicking on it, and going down to inspect the document. And then it says, okay, before I can go ahead and check, you have to save it. So say yes. Let's go ahead and save it now. And then it gives you a list of everything that it's going to check throughout the entire workbook, including comments and annotations. And, well, you can scroll down and see them all. And then if you don't want to inspect for like hidden worksheets, go ahead and uncheck it. But I do want to find hidden worksheets and have them removed. And know that when you inspect it, it looks for it. It doesn't remove them, but just inspects it to see if it can find any. So when I click on inspect, it found it has comments and annotations. Then it gives you the option after you inspect it to go ahead and remove all. It doesn't allow you to remove one comment, but all the comments. It's a nuke, dude. Remove all. Remove all. Document properties are gone. They're toast. And then we got hidden rows and columns. Let me click and drag this down. That's the hidden column, right? So when I remove it, it doesn't open it up and push it over to allow F to be seen, but it actually deletes it and then realphabetizes it. So remove it. Let me click and drag that down. It opened up and realphabetized it, but didn't push the bonus table over in any case. Then hidden worksheet, remove it, it's gone. Close out. Because when I right click on the sheet tab, any one of the sheet tabs, I no longer get the unhide option because it's been deleted. And of course, the column has been deleted and reordered here, alphabetically that is. And the comments are gone. And then backstage file to info to properties. 
hyperlink base and the company name's gone, and anything else in the properties section, including the advanced properties. And then finally, after you inspect it, you may want to come back over here and read it. And it says the content that people with disabilities find difficult to read is still an issue. And the one that concerns me is that a setting that automatically removes properties and personal information when the file is saved is turned on when you save the file. Ooh, we talked about that in an earlier training video. So when you hand this off to somebody else, this is turned on. And so when you come over here and try to type in some property information or other personal information, when you click Save, automatically deletes it. If you don't want that to happen, especially when the next person is going to be entering in properties and they click Save, all that work gets destroyed. They have to re-enter it again, and then when they click save again, it gets destroyed until they look at my training video, or of course you tell them, that they have to go backstage here, down to Options, to the Trust Center, over to the Trust Center Settings, to Privacy Options, and there it is. It got turned on. Remove personal information from properties on save. I don't like that. So be sure to uncheck that. Click Okie Dokie, click Okie Dokie. And then when you go backstage and enter in your properties, like the company name, comments, things like that, and you click Save, it doesn't get destroyed. It actually stays in the properties. If you want to protect the structure of your workbook, when it comes to the worksheets, that is, so they can't click and drag and move them around, or even delete or insert additional worksheets, or even change the colors or add colors to the worksheet tabs, because whew, you take that away to be able to work with the colors, and you've lost the inner artist. Let's go ahead and come up here and click on the Review tab. Go to the Changes group, and there it is, Protect Workbook. Click on that, and you can type in a password. It's optional. If you don't, you have the first layer of security, meaning that they can't accidentally delete a worksheet tab. Well, they have to go out of their way to delete it, to rearrange it. But even more so, if they have to come up here to deselect it, to unprotect it, to be able to do that. Or even more so, if they have to type in a password to unprotect it, to be able to do it. So I typed in the password P-A-S-S, -S, and by default it's a structure, and I'll show you that in just a minute, everything that we just talked about, and plus a little bit more. And the Protect Workbook for Windows was done away in Excel 2013, and it's still not available in 2016. Go ahead and click OK, then type in the password again to confirm the password, hit Enter. And now when I come down here and I try to click and drag the worksheet over to move it after commission, you can see I get a circle with a black line through it that says, oh, you can't do it, let go. If I right-click on one of the worksheet tabs, you can see all the features that are no longer available because they're faded. I can't insert, delete, rename, and so on. Oh, the tab color. Drat. I want that. So to go ahead and bring it back, then I have to come up here to the Changes group on the Review tab and deselect Protect Workbook. And if I have the password, zing zing, we can go ahead and hit Enter, and it opens it up. Then I can come back down here, right-click, and do a fancy tab color like this one right here. Red, Accent 2, Darker 25%. There are three ways you can go about password protecting your workbook. One is that they have to have a password to open it. Or two, they can open it, but they have to have a password to modify it. Or three, a combination of both. So for example, to be able to have a password to open it, to set the password, you can do it one of a couple of ways. You can either come backstage by clicking on the File tab, going down to Protect Workbook, and say that you want to encrypt with password. Click on it, then type in a password, P-A-S-S, hit Enter. And then P-A-S-S -S again, hit Enter, and it's locked. So let's go ahead and go backstage, close out of it. Oh, be sure to save it, because if you don't save it, then the password doesn't apply to it. So you want to click Save. So when I go ahead on the desktop, double-click to open it back up, it wants that password. P-A-S-S, -S, hit Enter. Then I can go ahead and view the workbook and make my changes. Now to go ahead and remove the password, go ahead and click on File. Go down to, well, info selected by default, go down to protect workbook and deselect encrypt with password. And then just go ahead and delete the password, click OK. Then go back to the front stage, click save, so you can save it without the password. Then when you go ahead and close out of it, double click to open it back up, you don't need a password. Now you can do it that way, or you can go ahead and do a save as. And you can do that by going backstage, file to save as, or add it as a command to the quick access toolbar, or hit the F12 key on the keyboard. Either way, it opens up the save as window. And then come down here and click on tools, go down to general options, and you can type in the password to open right there as well. So PASS, hit enter, PASS, hit enter, and then be sure to save it to overwrite it, to update it with the password protection by saying yes. 
And then when you close out, double click to open it back up. You gotta type in the password, P-A-S-S, hit enter, and there we go. Now we have access to it. Now if you go backstage, file, to info, you can see that it's protected. It requires a password to open it. So either way, you can go backstage as I showed you earlier on and come down and encrypt it there. Or you can do a save as and type in the password there underneath the tools menu. And you can also remove the password here as well or go back, click on save as, click on tools, go down on general options and delete your password there. Click okie dokie, click save to update it with the changes. Say yes, go ahead and close out. Then go ahead and double click to open it back up. It doesn't require a password and phew, great. Let's go ahead and do this again, only this time. Let's do it where they have to have a password to modify it. They can open it, but they can't make any changes to it without the password. So go ahead and do a save as, tools, general options, down below, password to modify, PASS, hit enter, PASS, hit enter, go ahead and click save, click yes, close out, we understand the protocol, double click to open it up, and now you get two choices. Well, you get three. You can either go ahead and type in the password to open it up, to read and make changes to it, or if you don't have the password, just read only, or you can click cancel. But if we don't have the password, click on read only. Opens it up, and you can see up there on the title bar, it's read only, so you can come in here and make some changes by typing over anything, deleting it, and hey, what's the deal? How come I can make changes to it? Well, you can, but when you come up to save it, it forces you to do a save as, because you can't overwrite the original, you have to go ahead and save it as something else. So go ahead and click okie dokie, forces the save as window, so it gives it a new name, the generic copy of the original here. That's fine, click save. Then when I close out, there's the copy of the original that when I double click to open it up doesn't require the password, but it saved the changes that I made to the document that required the password that forced me to do the save as. So let's go ahead and close out of that, open up the original. And then if I do have the password, I can go ahead and type it in, P-A-S-S. -S. And that way, if you want somebody to view it, but you don't want them to change it, you can go ahead and password protect it, but under the modify option, and those who can make changes to it, well, you give them the password. Then go ahead and click okie dokie, then to remove it, again, go ahead and hit the F12 key on the keyboard to open up the save as window, tools, to general options, delete the password, then go ahead and click OK, click OK, click Save It, then the password's gone. Or you can go ahead and do a combination of both. We'll say Pass, P-A-S-S to open it, P-A-S-S to modify it. How does that work? Let's go ahead and click OK, P-A-S-S to open it, and to modify it, let's click Save to override it, click Yes, go ahead and close out, double click to open it up. First of all, we need a password to open it, so if we get past that security clearance, we do have the password, then it opens, then it says, okay, you can open it now, but whether or not you can make changes to it, well, if you got the password, go ahead and type it in. Otherwise, you can only view it and read it. So if we do have that second password, cool, we got pass clearance number two. And here we go again. Go ahead and click on save as or hit the F12 key on the keyboard to go ahead and go down to tools, to general options, to delete, to delete both of them so we can go back to a non-password protected workbook for both opening and modifying it. Click okie dokie, click save, click yes, close out, double click, open up, we have access. The always create backup feature will initially create a backup copy of the original workbook, after which that copy will back up always on the second save of the original workbook. So for example, here's my original workbook, it's called Create Backup, and I want to go ahead and turn on the feature to always create a backup. To do that, you want to go ahead and come up here on the Quick Access Toolbar and click on Save As, or hit the F12 key on the keyboard, or go backstage to file the Save As. In any case, bring up the Save As window, because in the Save As window, you want to click on the Tools to go down to General Options. And it's right there, check Always Create Backup. Click OK. Click Save to update that with the feature turned on, and then say Yes, and then go ahead and close out of it, and you can see now on my desktop, I have a backup of my original workbook. And how can you tell the difference between the two? Well, a couple ways. One, this one says Backup, and then the name of the original workbook, and then you can see when I hover over it, the pop-up says it's an Excel backup file, 
and then you can also see the icons one on top of another the spreadsheets and the arrow point to the one behind it meaning that that's a backup of the original on top and then if you have your extensions turned on well if you don't you want to learn about extensions then you can watch my windows training video on extensions you can see it's .xlk as opposed to .xlsx so that's the backup and if i double click to open it up and say yes of course i trust this then you can see it's just a snapshot of the original. So let's go ahead and close out of it, go back to the original, double click create backup, and make a change. So instead of Doug, how about if we go ahead and add ease for Doug Ease, hit enter and click save. Now when I click save, it doesn't update the backup because the whole purpose behind this is that you're one edit ahead of the backup. So you've got what you wanted here by clicking save and then the backup in case if you made a mistake after you saved it and you go, oh, what was it before? Was it Douglas, Douglas? Then you can go ahead and close out and go back to the backup, which is right there, backup, double click and say, yes, we trust it. And then there it is, the original was Doug. So if I close out of here and then go back to my original, double click, and I say, okay, let's go ahead and make another change. I just learned again, he's not Doug E's, he's Doug's. And hit enter and click save. Then it takes what used to be there because it's the second save and it updates it, not with the latest here, but what was before, it was Doug E's. So if I go ahead and close out of here and open up the backup down below, double click. Of course, I trust it. There it is, Doug E's. So the whole purpose is, is with this one edit ahead of the backup is that the latest change that was made is going to be in your original. But then after that, when you click save for the second time, it'll copy over what used to be there into the backup. And to prove my point, let's go ahead and close out of the backup and go back to the original. And say, OK, we've got Doug's. Let's go ahead and just do D Heffernan and hit enter. When I click save, it doesn't update the backup, but if I go ahead and click save again on the second save, it actually updates it to everything that I have here. So now I no longer have a backup, I just have a snapshot of my original. So long story short, don't ever click save twice in the same session because then you won't have a backup. For example, when I close out of here and I go to the backup, double click to open it up and say yes, guess what? It's D Heffernan. And then, of course, if you want to turn it off, you no longer want to be connected to the backup or have the backup. Then let's go ahead and close out of the backup. Go back to the original. Double click. And then bring up the Save As window. Hit the F12 key on the keyboard. Go down to Tools, to General Options, and uncheck or break the link to that second workbook, which is the backup. Click OK. Click Save, saying that you want to replace it with those changes. Say Yes. Go ahead and close out. It's no longer connected. How do you know? Well, if I go ahead and open it back up, the original, and I delete Heffernan Douglas here, or D, and I click save, 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 save. Well, that's the second save plus then some, so it ought to reflect the original here completely. So if we close out, that is if it was still connected, and go back to the backup here and double click and say yes, we trust it. It doesn't because it's no longer linked. We broke the link. The shared workbook feature is used to share your workbook with others on your network, allowing them to make changes to it at the same time. And it highlights those changes with different colors for different users who made the changes, but only after they save their changes on their end, and then you save it on your end, will you then be able to pull in their updated changes. So for example, here's my spreadsheet or the workbook, share workbooks on the network and to be able to share this workbook so everybody else can access it at the same time to turn the feature on come down and click on the review tab on the ribbon go to the changes group and there it is share workbook click on it and check the box allow changes by more than one user at the same time this also allows workbook merging which we'll talk about in another training video so let's go ahead and click on the advanced tab to see what the default options are and see if we want to change any like when it comes to tracking changes, you can keep the history for those changes up to 30 days. The default, you can do more or less or don't keep track at all. You can also have the changes updated in your view or in your session when you're sharing it with others, when you save the file or have it done automatically every so many minutes. And then if there's a conflict, like for example, 
When Carrie's in the workbook at the same time that I'm viewing it, and she makes a change here to January for fantasy sales, types in zero, and then saves it, it's out there until I go ahead and if I make a change to the same cell and click save, then hers is coming in, mine's going out, there's a conflict. So what do you want to do? Go ahead and ask me which changes win, or the changes being saved wins. So whoever made the last save, they win. In any case, choose what you'd like, click okie dokie. It's going to now change it to a shared workbook. Click OK again. And then up here, it adds in square brackets, shared. So now you know that the workbook is being shared. I'm going to go ahead and have Carrie open up the shared workbook and make some changes. And then when I click Save, we'll see what it looks like then on our end, those changes that she made. OK, she said that she made some changes. To bring in those changes, just come up here, click on the Save button. And there you go. It's been updated. Click Okie dokie. And, oh, that's horrifying. It's got a highlight of a light green. It's hard to tell which cells she made changes to. Uh, you may be able to squint or be able to detect the light shade of green. In any case, when you hover over the cell that she made the change to, you can see in the pop-up the comment or the note. It was by Carrie Heffernan on that date at that time. And the name of the cell, what it was, and what it changed to. It used to be 150 and it changed to 0. Then the others is from 300 to 1. And this one from 225 to 2, and then 300 to 3, and, oh, can't see it, better scroll over. There we go, 350 to 4. Let me go ahead and scroll back. Now that can be very helpful because if I'm looking at it, when I hover over it, and I'm like, no, 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 it's not 0, it's actually 150. When I make a change, any change, or edit, to the spreadsheet, it automatically clears out the highlights to the cells that she made the changes in. So if I'm like, oh, rats. What were those cells? Well, that's pretty obvious, one, two, three, four, but if you couldn't readily tell what the cells were, then you can come up here on the Review tab, go to the Changes group, and track those changes. Click on the drop-down arrow and say Accept or Reject Changes. The action will now save the workbook because you have to save it before you can continue. Click OK and go with the default. Those that haven't been reviewed yet, and click OK. And then it goes through and it says OK. The current cell that we have selected the original value is 150. Carrie said it was 0, but then you changed it back to 150. What one do you want? You can go ahead and select Carrie and say, OK, accept that one. And you can see that it, it made the update to 0, and it goes to the next change. So over here, she made the change that used to be 300 to 1. Do you want to accept it, reject it? And if you want to just plow through the rest of them without reviewing them, you can say accept all or reject all. We can say reject it. Reject it, reject it, and then the final one, reject it. So the only one that we accepted was the first one. And if you decide later on that you didn't like what you accepted or rejected, that's it. It's a one-time deal because if you come back up here and try to do it again, accept, reject changes, and, well, they've been reviewed. Even if you uncheck that and say, let's just do it for everyone who made changes, and you click okie dokie, it says, ah, there are no more changes to accept or reject. It was a one-time thing. Now let's go ahead and see what it looks like when Carrie types in a number here and saves it. And before I go ahead and save it, I'm also going to type in a number in the same cell, 222, and then click Save. So she already saved hers for the cell before, and the change is sitting out there for me to pull in. It only pulls in after I click Save, but because I made the change to the same cell when I click Save, we're going to have a, uh-oh, a conflict. Your changes on sheet product sales are thus. And you said it was going to go from 0 to 222. But Carrie said, instead of 222, she wanted 999. Which one do you want? Do you want to accept yours or the other? And if you had additional conflicts, because you can go nuts, you could actually go ahead and change all the data in here, one cell at a time. And she could have done that at the same time, but saved hers first. Then when you click Save on your end, her updates are coming in here, but yours are going up and they conflict, in which case you can go, okay, you can do it one at a time by selecting one at a time your changes, or selecting the conflicting change and accept yours or the other, or do all of hers or all of yours. So, all right, we'll go with the other. And your workbook has been updated with changes made by others. Click okie dokie, and you can see the green highlight. Well, okay, I don't know if you can see the green highlight. It's so light green. But in any case, if you go ahead and Make another change or an edit, type in something, it disappears. Let me go ahead and delete that. And if you're like, okay, I'd like to go ahead and review that again, 
Then you can come back up here to track changes to accept or reject. Of course, save the workbook. Click okie dokie. Not reviewed yet. Click OK. And it's just the one. So then you can go ahead and say, you know what? I don't want to accept that. I'd like to reject it. In which case, it goes back to zero because it doesn't remember the conflict that you had as 222. We already bypassed that when we accepted her change. Now it's just the difference between the original zero and her edit, 999. Now you ought to know that when you're sharing your workbook, Excel doesn't support certain features like deleting worksheets, merging, and splitting cells. So for example, if I come down here and right click, I can't delete the worksheet. Better yet, if you want to come up here and click on any one of these tabs, like the Home tab, no conditional formatting, no format as tables. Those aren't available, and you can go through and look at the other tabs and see what's faded and not available, like the theme for colors, fonts, and effects. And then finally, anybody can go ahead and unshare the workbook. Well, that's not very nice. In other words, if I come up here and click on Share Workbook, and I go to the Editing tab, and I say, oh, I don't want to share it, uncheck it, and I click OK, this action will remove the workbook from shared use. The change history will be erased, and other users who are editing this workbook will not be able to save their changes, even if you share this workbook again. Are you sure you want to remove it? OK, we'll say no, and we'll keep it shared. So when I come back up here, in any case, anybody can do that. And notice that this workbook shows who has it open. It's got me and Carrie Heffernan. Now I can go ahead and select Carrie Heffernan and say, he, he, he. I'm going to be a little monster and remove her from having access to the shared workbook. Now if I do that, it says that the action will prevent the user from saving the workbook and the user's unsaved work will be lost. Well, that's horrifying. Let's not do that. We can go ahead and click cancel and say, well, we won't do that. But let's go ahead and have Carrie do it to us so I can show you what happens when somebody does it to you. Okay, she just said that she removed us from sharing the workbook. And there's no dancing clown that comes out and says, hey, the only way that you'll know if you've been kicked out is, well, one way is to go ahead and type in something, make a change, and then go, okay, let me go ahead and save it. In which case it says, uh, no, you're no longer connected to the file. Somebody may have kicked you out. Ooh, how naughty. So if you want to go ahead and preserve your unsaved work, click OK and save the shared workbook with a different name. Then you can go ahead and open up the original shared workbook again and merge in those changes from the copy of the workbook that you just saved. And we'll talk about that in a later training video, that you can go ahead and merge workbooks together, shared workbooks that is. In any case, let's just go ahead and click. It opens up the Save As window, in which case I'd have to say, well, this is shared workbook number two and then click Save, updates it up at the top, and so it's a duplicate or a copy of the original shared workbook, in which case in another training video, you can go ahead and merge the two together. As you recall, when you come up here and click on Share Workbook, it also allows workbook merging. Like I said, we'll cover that in a later training video, but if somebody does that to you and you're like, oh rats, how do I go ahead and merge that back into the shared workbook after I save a copy of my changes that I don't want to lose? Go ahead and watch my Merge and Compare Workbooks training video. If you want to be able to access your files from anywhere and share with anyone with internet connection, including this workbook here, then go back to stage File, down to Save As, and select OneDrive. And there you go. You can use this to access your files from anywhere and share with anyone. So you got this little cute diagram here, this cloud that means, hey, it's somewhere out there where you can store everything that you upload, either from your mobile devices, laptop, or desktop. Actually, it's just a computer that Microsoft owns called a server at some undisclosed location that you can load up to, and then when you want, log from some other device and be able to retrieve it. In any case, to be able to access this, you need to sign up for it. So if you haven't done so, get a Microsoft account by clicking on Sign Up and then go ahead and click on sign up for free. You can do it with a personal account or a business. Now if you go for a business, you have plans and pricing. So we'll select create a Microsoft account here for the OneDrive. Well, before you type in an email address and a password to create the account, plus anything else that they want from you, you may want to go ahead and read the Microsoft Service Agreements Privacy and Cookie Statement. So that way you're okay with what they're going to do with your information that you store on their server. And if you're okay with that, and after you go ahead and sign up for it, then go ahead and go back to Excel. Same place. This time, go ahead and click on Sign In. Type in the email address. 
that you provided for the Microsoft account, then click Next or hit Enter, then the password, then hit Enter, and we're logged in. How do you know? Well, you can look up here on the title bar area. You got a bunch of lines and arrows. It's all over the place saying, hey, we're connected throughout the universe, as it were. And you can see that you've got your name that I'm signed in. And so once you're signed in, then go back to the OneDrive, and then come over here and click on Documents. Opens up the Documents folder on the OneDrive. You can see there's the OneDrive address in the Documents folder. And it looks like we already have this uploaded, OneDrive Sharing. We can go ahead and call this OneDrive Sharing 2, or just something else altogether. Rename it, call it My Spiffy Sales Workbook. And then when you're done, go ahead and click Save. Uploads it to the OneDrive. And then any changes you make in here, like 100, hit enter, click save, it overwrites it on the OneDrive. And then when you're done, you can just go ahead and close out, or you can sign out. Now, during this logging in process, it may, after you go ahead and save it to the OneDrive, take it to the front stage view and open up a window if you want to share this with others. In fact, if you just come up here and click on the Share tab, opens it up, and it says, hey, who do you want to invite? Well, I'd like to invite a lot of people. If you have some contacts in your Microsoft Outlook, go ahead and click on the address book, and you can go ahead and double click to add them down below, their email addresses, click okie dokie. And then you got two options. When you send it off to them, they can either edit it or view it. And to get more nitty gritty about this, let me go ahead and open up Internet Explorer and go to the Share OneDrive Files and Folders, the website here. And when you scroll down, it shows you how to go ahead and, there we go, can view or can edit. And it goes over what it means if you allow people to view it. They can view, download, or copy the files you share, edit. And it says if you choose can edit or if you pick can edit, in any case, they can go ahead and make changes to it. And if it's to a folder, they can delete or edit anything within that folder. But right now we're just sharing our Excel workbook, my spiffy sales workbook, that is. And one thing you need to keep in mind is that whether you choose can view or can edit, that when you send it off to somebody, that they can go ahead and forward that link onto anybody else, and they can go ahead and access it as well. So it's not exclusionary where you send it to one person and only they get access to it. Well, as long as you don't share it with anybody else, nobody else has access to it. So keep that in mind. Let me go ahead and close out and then choose what you like and edit. In fact, if you want, you don't have an address book, you can just go ahead and delete it and type in their email address. And there you go. Well, she's in my address book, so she's gonna pull up from my Microsoft Outlook installed on the computer here. In any case, you can go ahead and type in their full email address if it doesn't pull up anything. If it does, you can go ahead and click on it and then say you can view and then include a message if you want saying, hey, please take a look at this and let me know what you think. And then when you're done, go ahead and click Share. It'll send her an email to invite her. And you can see down below, it's a Can View. You can go ahead and right-click on it and remove the user or change permissions to Can Edit at any point. In fact, if you close out of here and you're like, oh, how is this document being shared or is it being shared? Go ahead and click on the Share tab. Opens it back up and then it lets you know, hey, you're the owner and this is who you're sharing with. Now you can do it that way, or you can come down below and click on Get a Sharing Link. Click on it. And you can create an edit link. Anyone with this link can edit the document you share. Or a view link only. Anyone with this link can see the documents you share, but not edit them. So if you want to edit, if not edit, in any case, it's a link that you can click on. It generates it. Go ahead and click on Copy. And then after you copy, you can go ahead and well, share it on Facebook or paste it somewhere if you want to be able to have that available for people to click on. In any case, when you click back and you go to the beginning here, then you can see it's with Carrie and, and anyone that they can view this link. You can right click on it, disable the link, or copy the link. You can also publish it to docs.com if you want to go a little bit more in depth and detail there. In any case, we'll keep it simple. And then when you're done, let's go ahead and close out. We can come back up here, up in the title bar area where it says Curtis signed in, click on it. Go down to Account Settings and say Sign Out. It gives you a big, huge warning that says, hey, if you do this, then you're signing out from this and other Office applications. It will remove all customizations. And your documents and notebooks may not sync to the server until you sign back in. Well, they can't sync if they're not signed in. 
all open office applications must be closed for the sign out to be complete. Do you want to sign out? Yes. So we're signed out. We no longer have the lines up at the top here and it asks us to sign in again. In any case, let's go ahead and close out of that. And if you want to access the OneDrive on the road and you don't have a computer that you can go ahead and log in, like through one of the office applications like Excel, just go ahead and open up Internet Explorer and go right to Sky. There you go. SkyDrive. Just type it in like you see it there. SkyDrive.live.com. Hit enter. The same place where we went to sign up for free, you can go ahead and click on sign in. Type in your email address for the Microsoft account. Click next. And then, of course, your password. Go ahead and hit enter to sign in. And that's what it looks like. Here's the documents folder where we saved the documents to. Go ahead and click on it to take a look inside. And hey, there we go. There's my spiffy sales. And you can view your documents by tiles. And the purpose of a tile is that if you have a touch screen, that you can go ahead and tap it with your finger. That's why they're yay big. Or you can come up here and click on the choice option to go from tiles to list. Now it just has a list here, so it's not really finger friendly. You can use your mouse to be able to click on it. In any case, we'll go back to tiles. Oh, the other option is photos. In any case, there's my spiffy sales. When you hover over it, you get the option to check it, to select it, and with it selected, you get the options up above. That you can share this if you want to share it with others, and also select additional documents. So between the two, we can go ahead and share them both, download them, delete them, move them to, or copy to another place on the OneDrive. I'll go ahead and unselect that. You can also right-click on it and get the same options in addition to other options. The least of which is the details. So if I want to be able to find out who I'm sharing with over here in the detail pane, you can see that it's Carrie Heffernan. And anyone who has this link can view the item. Now, if I don't want that, then we can go ahead and close out and say you want to remove this link. Then anybody who has the link can no longer view it. And then you can change from Carrie Heffernan from can view to allow to edit or even stop sharing. In which case, she has the link that was sent to her via email. When she clicks on it, it doesn't allow her access to it. But then again, if you want to add people, it's right there. Go ahead and click on Add. Now, you're going to get the same options as I just showed you when you're trying to share it through the application itself, Microsoft Excel. However, by default, it says anyone with this link can edit this item. Well, if you don't want them to edit it, you just want them to view it, then click on it to uncheck Allow Editing. Then you can go ahead and generate a link that you can send to them. It just allows them to view it or send them an email. You can click on More, and then you can go ahead and get the link and paste it in Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Sina Weibo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. In any case, go ahead and get a link, click on it, generates a link. You can copy and then paste it in Facebook or Twitter, which doesn't allow editing. Or you can go ahead and click on Email. Type in the email address, a message about, hey, I want your thoughts on my spiffy sales. Then click share, sends them the email with the link that they can then go ahead and click on and opens it up and they can do whatever they need to do. And when you do bring up the details for any one of these tiles here, the documents you've uploaded, like you can right click, of course, on it to bring up the details. Or if you just want to hover over it and check it, you can come up here in the upper right hand corner and click on the I for informational, which brings up the details pane and you can deselect it to close it. So you can do it that way or right click again to details, right click again to go down to details or click on the I. So either way, it'll open and close. Now to see what it looks like on the other end, the receiving end, when somebody sends us an invite to either view and or edit their documents from the OneDrive. Let's go ahead and close out of here, and I want to open up Outlook 2016, which, by the way, if you don't know anything about it, you can watch my Outlook training video on it. It's basically an email program. Let's go ahead and click OK to open it up. Not only does it send and receive emails, as you just saw here from Carrie, but it also has calendars, contacts, tasks, notes, a lot of fun things. But we're just going to focus on the email, the invite we got from Carrie Heffernan. Double-click to open it up. And you can see it says, hey, please take a look and let me know what you think. Oh, what's this? Oh, let me just go ahead and willy-nilly click on any link. Well, you want to make sure you trust the person. Go ahead and click on it. It takes me to the OneDrive, and it opens up Excel. Hey, great. And she wants me to review it. These are the cells that she made. Cool. I can go ahead and edit it in the browser if I'd like. Click on Edit in Browser. 
so she allowed me the edit option. So with the edit in the browser option, we're kind of limited to some of the features. It's a dummy down version of the full Excel install. So I get some of the quick options to do some editing, formatting. I can make changes to it and say, no, 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 the price is not 80 cents, it's 0 0.7, hit enter. And if the tools I'm looking for, to be able to work it more in detail, it's not available in the Excel Online, then I can come over here and click on Edit in Excel. So if you have Excel installed on your computer, okay, now it wants me to sign in with my own account to be able to download it to the Excel program installed on my computer so I can get the full functionality of Excel and not the watered-down version of Excel Online. But again, it's a great thing because if you don't have Excel installed on your computer and you're out on the road somewhere, at least you can do the basics. So, and then once I sign in, it says, are you sure you trust this? Of course I do. Some files contain viruses. Are you sure you still want to trust us? Yes. Opens up the Excel program on my computer. There we go. And then it gives me a warning. It says, be careful. Files from the internet can contain viruses. Unless you need to edit it, it's safer to stay in protected view. Okay, I'll click on Enable Editing because I trust Carrie. So then I can go ahead and get the full functionality of the Excel program installed on my computer, not Excel Online. Any changes I make here, 0 0.8, and click Save. It uploads it. I don't know if you saw that. You may want to rewind the video. But down the status bar, it says uploading here back to the OneDrive. And then when you're done, go ahead and close out. That was nice. And then if you ever run into a blockage issue, like you cannot view it or edit this anymore, for example, let me go ahead and close out of here. And I click on the link again. And after I log in, well, the item might not exist or is no longer available. So she either deleted it or she blocked me. I no longer can view it. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.